So we've got these damping forces in action. And it's really the damping forces that I want to look at next. So this is entirely qualitative. There's no maths now until we reach the buffers at the end of the syllabus. I'm just trying to complete the picture in a qualitative sense. So if we look at damped oscillations, we're going to expect the amplitude of the oscillation to decrease as a function of time, just because you know, frictional force is being applied. The period isn't changed, right? So frequency should be unchanged. For the case of a pendulum, that's just to do with the length of the piece of string. For a spring, it's just to do with the spring constant, so how stiff the spring is. Uh, but the amplitude will tend to decrease. Uh, so in the case of light damping, we've got the sort of thing that you can see up there. So a gradual, a slow decrease uh, in amplitude. Uh, if we apply heavy damping, uh, then you know we get a really we don't get oscillations at all. We just get the amplitude slowly decreasing. In other words, you know, imagine swinging your pendulum bob uh, in custard. All right, it's likely that it will simply slowly drift down towards the equilibrium position and stop. You've heated your custard up a little bit in the process. Uh, microwaves are quicker, uh, but nevertheless, that's, that, that's what we're talking about in terms of heavy damping. Um, there is a point in between uh, which is called critical damping, uh, and it's worth uh, thinking about that, I suppose, a little bit. Critical, <coughs> excuse me. Critical damping is shown on the slide as a relatively rapid return to the equilibrium position, but without overshooting it. Okay. So it, again, this is a very qualitative definition. So let me think of examples of critical and heavy damping. Most. Um, it, oh, I, have we still got dial type instruments in the lab, multimeters and so on? Or are they all digital? I can't remember what's in the lab now. I've still got a multimeter at home, for instance, that I bought about 40 years ago that you know actually has a lever that swings across the scale. All of that style of instrument would have been designed with critical damping. In other words, it goes to its position where you're supposed to be reading a number without oscillating to either side of it. Um, what's a more everyday example? Car suspension systems are generally designed to have something that approximates to critical damping. So that if your car goes over a pothole or a you know, ripple in the road, whatever it might be, you don't get this continual oscillation of the car as you continue to drive along the road. Right? So critical damping is something that an engineer will aspire to in the design of, at least in this part of the world. Right? I have driven higher cars in the States where it's definitely subcritical. It is like driving a water bed along the road. But, um, you know, that's just differences in style, I suppose. Um, heavy damping, um, oh, cross-channel ferry, all right? They have um, aerolons, whatever they're called, to either side of the boat, which prevent or attempt to prevent rocking in heavy seas. <coughs> Right? Most large ships are stabilised in that fashion. So it's an active process of counteracting whatever the waves are trying to do. That will be an example of heavy damping. You don't want people to feel the movement of the boat. You don't even want critical damping. You don't actually want noticeable motion at all. So actually in that case, you're aiming for, for heavy damping. Um, Okay, so major last bit. Um, this is in terms of, of forcing oscillations. Okay, we've so far we've implicitly we've talked about free oscillations, frictionless uh, oscillations. So in the case of the pendulum, we've moved the pendulum bob to one side and let go. In the case of the spring, we extended it and let go. All right. Um, but now think in terms of, of uh, you know, pushing a child on a swing. where well, you're putting in energy on a periodic basis. Okay? That is a forced oscillation. It's not now an isolated system. It's a system where there is additional forces 
uh, going on as we move through. So you can uh, apply then a periodic force uh, to the system. Now, let go of the swing, as it were, when it's oscillating, and you'll find the natural frequency of the child on the swing. And it's just going to be to do with the length of chains or rope or whatever it is, right? It's a pendulum, after all. That's the natural frequency of the system. Uh, it's the frequency you get when you ping the side of a, you know, brandy glass, if you're into brandy glasses, right? Uh, anything that has a note like that, uh, that is its natural frequency. So it's not just child swings that we're talking about. So, there is an argument now that says that if you periodically put force into that system that is in phase with, that is at the natural frequency of that object, you will be continually building up its amplitude. Again, think of child on swing. All right, you're putting force in at the same part of the oscillation every time. It's as the swing comes back to you, you're putting more force in as it starts its next oscillation. So the amplitude builds up, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about in terms of uh, a system that we say is in resonance. It's where the force going in is at a frequency that is matched to the natural frequency of that object. So you can get it in terms of pushing a child on a swing, you can get it in electronic circuits, there's all sorts of places where this is going to come up. Um, okay, but the forced oscillations in general. We're only talking about resonance when the frequency of, of the force that's going in is matched to the natural frequency of the object. So let's have a look at this graphically. Uh, if we've got no frictional forces, so no damping, then if we're putting a periodic force in at the natural frequency, the amplitude is just going to continue going up and up and up, right, until the system falls apart. With frictional forces, there is, of course, another force that's trying to slow it down. All right, so it's, again, child on the swing. There's lots of frictional forces involved there. Right? At the suspension point of the chains or the rope on the swing, air friction, all of those things are taking, uh, taking their toll. So with, with light uh, um, or increasingly heavy damping, this tendency to go up to some infinite amplitude which never would be, of course, the system would literally pull itself apart before then. But nevertheless, that tends, tends, uh, tendency is pulled back. Um, so our amplitude isn't quite like it. So just to show you some classic examples uh, of how this operates. Anyone seen this before? Wine glasses shattering with sound. It's worth watching. So the frequency of this speaker cone is going to change to match the resonant frequency of the glass, right? The, the bit of capillary, glass capillary standing in there, straw, whatever it is, is simply to show you more easily uh, the vibrations going on in this piece of glass. It's expensive to do this, but actually this is a really good thing for schools out there. really hard on the ears but it's quite dramatic when you see this happen uh, so this is the classic opera singer breaking the wine glass scenario it's just been done without the opera singer um, uh, so what else was I going to show you oh yeah okay so this is from way back um, which is a bridge it's on a loop, this thing, so just keep going. Uh, it's a bridge in a place called Tacoma Narrows in the United States, and this happened in 1940. Um, I've got some other versions of this that I'll show you. But this is a classic case. This was before, you know, computer techniques of finite element analysis that engineers can use and so on. The eddies in the wind that travel along this valley on this particular day 
were at precisely the resonant frequency of this suspension bridge. Right? So not strong forces in their own right, but they were being applied continually at the resonant frequency of the bridge. So the amplitude of oscillation builds up and builds up and builds up until the thing pulls itself apart. Right? Now those of you who are sharp enough at watching this will realise that this is this is doing some torsional offer, right? But it's actually remembered if you look at it, this is essentially fundamental and first overtone we're watching. Mm. Right? So it's setting up that oscillation in this uh, in this um, in this bridge. This, I think, if I remember, uh, okay, it's not visible now. Um, this is quite fun. So this is. This is when engineers did have computer codes that should have told them this happened. This is the Millennium Bridge that crosses from St Paul's to Tate Modern in London, right? I'm sure a lot of you have walked across this before. This is when it was first opened. And this is precisely why, uh, you know, troops from Roman legions onwards are told not to march over bridges, but to break their step. It's because as soon as you get a little bit of oscillation going, the natural tendency of the human body is to compensate. And so actually what these people are doing, unwittingly, by moving the mass of their body around, is putting a periodic force into this bridge that is matching its natural frequency of oscillation. So the Millennium Bridge is in resonance, and there were people literally vomiting on the bridge because they got seasick. So the whole thing was closed down. It took ages and ages and ages, and um, uh, eventually it was redesigned simply by putting in some more dissipative forces, and that was in the form of springs, essentially, that damped the oscillation down. So if you walk over the Millennium Bridge now, you don't get this happening. But it actually got closed down, I think it was well over a year, before people came up with a viable engineering solution to this. So there we are. Within the last sort of decade and a bit, people have still been getting resonance effects wrong uh, in structures. Okay, this is just a quote from um, Middlemarch. Anyone read Middle Middlemarch? You should. You should read George Eliot, actually. She's a really great writer. This is tail end of the 19th century. Middlemarch is actually set in about the 1850s, 1860s. So sometime before the Great Reform Act in Parliament, which you'll all know about, of course, because you <coughs> know about British political history. Um, but anyway, she was describing um, resonance effects uh, in um, somewhat more poetic fashion uh, than we might do as physicists. But here's my summary, <coughs> which I've done at the end of every section thus far. Uh, the important bits, as it were, that I think you need to remember. Well, there's a basic one, which is our definition of angu angular frequency. Um, this sort of equation from which we derive this, and therefore this, and therefore this. All right. So if you can remember that one, and then handle a bit of differentiation, you'll be okay for the rest of them. Uh, we talked then about force, and that was simply this equation multiplied by mass. So again, you should better produce that, uh, you know, without necessarily needing to memorise it. Um, the fact that energy is constant is the key point here, right? This is not an equation that you can memorise, but the physical result of that certainly. Likewise, these two equations, right? If I need you to do calculations based on those, I will almost certainly, in fact, I don't think I would ever not give you those equations. I would expect you to know what they mean, and well as what the symbols mean and so on. Um, but it's use of them that is important. And the fact that they derive again from a consideration of this basic acceleration equation up here. And then that you can define it. You can give me a sensible, concise definition of symbol harmonic motion.
uh, and of phenomena such as resonance that we've just talked about.